Hi, um, thanks to Dan uh, for having me here. Thanks for, to Sean for not being able to make it. Um, so obviously I am not Sean O'Connor. So um, this is uh, Lessons Learned Building Distributed Systems at Bitly with me, a former Bitly engineer. Um, I can't unfortunately talk very much in public about what I'm doing right now. Find me later and I can tell you a little bit more. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing is sort of applying the lessons that we learned at Bitly in a new greenfield sort of system. So this has been a, an interesting uh, exercise, uh, this talk and sort of writing down the things that I've been doing for the past several months. Um, I, I just used Sean's slides. Uh, I had to remove some jokes when he put the punchline in, but not the setup. So, you know, I'm sorry if it's not as funny. Um, but we're going to start with, uh, real quick, what, what is Bitly? Um, Bitly is short links, right? Bitly is, you know, bit.ly slash some six character thing. Um, well, it's, it's actually quite a bit more than that. So uh, social media, um, if you see like es.pn, that's a branded Bitly link. Um, social media gives you some degree of stats like, hey, look, uh, people retweeted this. People. Um, you know, favorited it. They don't tell you much else. They don't tell you exactly how many people clicked on it, um, or they do that in sort of a disparate way. Like Twitter has the Twitter ads thing, Facebook has its internal thing, but you don't get that all in one place. So Bitly kind of brings that all together. Um, and it not only gets um, all of your sort of overview, like, okay, we've got this many engagements on Twitter, we got this many engagements on Facebook and on Google Plus and Pinterest, um, but also we can see not just who, who acted on it, who commented or liked or retweeted or favorited, but who clicked on it, um, which is a much lighter signal and something that not all the social networks capture, um, but is very valuable uh, you know, to, to marketing teams and to, to branding teams. So. Um, all of this is, is really the Bitly product. Um, so, you know, how hard can it be, right? You're counting clicks and you're counting how many people uh, look at a thing. Well, um, Bitly counts just shy, uh, every day, Bitly counts just shy of a quarter billion clicks. Um, 20, 000, uh, 20 million new short links are created. Um, they crawl around 4 million pages a day. Um, Pages are crawled after they've been shortened and clicked on. Um, and they do that with a grand total of about 400 servers and two data centers and uh, something like 20 engineers right now who deploy continuously uh, around 20 to 35 times a day. Um, every one of those clicks gets counted in 12 to 15 maybe 12 to 20 different buckets, so that quarter of a billion clicks turns into around three to four billion metrics, um, individual metrics that are incremented every single day. Um, so Bitly is really a, uh, a big data company um, for most definitions of big data. Uh, and you know, the trick to doing all of this is uh, distributed systems. Bitly loves distributed systems. Bitly has something like 350 running services in production. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and it all works, which is even better. It gets a little bit confusing. And what do we mean by distributed systems? Um, I don't normally put this much text on slides. This is, I'm going to pass the buck off to Sean for this one. Um, but let's the, look at each sentence. All right, so a distributed system is a software system in which components located on network computers communicate and coordinate their actions by passing messages. What does that mean? You may be running in multiple processes on the same machine. You may be running in two different machi machines and two different data centers on different continents. Um, you can't assume that you can put something into a JavaScript array and get it out of the other end of the array. Um, the components interact with each other in order to achieve, achieve a common goal. If you just have two systems that are running at the same time and they're not talking and they're not doing the same thing at all, that's not really a distributed system. That's just two things. Um, there are three important characteristics of a distributed system. One is uh, concurrency of components, and I'm going to talk a little bit about concurrency specifically. Uh, lack of a global clock. So you have 400 different servers. There's a decent chance that no two of them actually agree what time it is. Um, and independent failures of components. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about that first one about concurrency. This is a slide from an incredible, incredible talk by Rob Pike, who's one of the authors of Go, uh, the programming language, um, called Concurrency is Not Parallelism. Um, and his definition of concurrency is programming as the composition of independently executing processes. And processes here, he doesn't necessarily mean like they have a PID and they're running in Linux and whatever. Um, it's more of a, a, a lay definition of processes. These are things like send an email might be a process. Um, it's not necessarily parallel. That might be limited by hardware, by you're running on one computer and it can only do one thing at a time. Um, but it's a prerequisite for parallel. So understanding how different components of your system can interact concurrently um, and how those may communicate make it much easier. Uh, and in fact, I think it's required to actually start building a distributed system when you take those concurrently executing things and you say, okay, well, since they're independent, um, this one's gonna run on this machine and this one's gonna run on that machine and this one's gonna run on another machine. And you know, maybe in the cloud, those two things will actually be on the same machine, we don't know, um, and it doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm gonna put that link up one more time. Um, I use bit.ly links everywhere, just to, because Sean. Um, so Pike concurrency. Uh, concurrency is not parallelism. Great talk, amazing talk, highly recommended. Um, so, all right, distributed systems, they're so great. Why do we, why do we want this? Why, what's even the motivation? Well, they're faster. Um, and a little spoiler, uh, they're especially faster when we try to do work asynchronously. Um, they're easier to scale. Different processes, different components of that system have different performance characteristics. Crypto often requires much more CPU or much more memory than um, sending email, which might take a lot of time on the network, but not actually a lot of time in the processor. So the ability to scale those uh, independently and to say like, okay, we need 50 email nodes, but only 20 uh, web nodes for whatever reason. Um, they're more robust. Uh, this is largely because they have to be more robust. Um, you have to sort of think about error and partial failure ahead of time and uh, up, like up front load that work. And because you front loaded that work, uh, the system will withstand those failures. Uh, because of all of those things, a consequence of, of you know, faster, uh, more scalable, uh, more robust, it becomes cheaper to run and it's more cost effective. Um, all right, so that's all great. Why isn't everything distributed? Well, it's also kind of hard. Um, it's not the same thing as building a non-distributed system. Um, so those three things that we talked about. Um, concurrency of components. They're all running sort of independently. That makes it easier to scale those components, but it means that you have to put a lot more thought into coordinating those components. Um, sometimes, if you're lucky, you don't have to coordinate between them much at all, but you have to think about whether or not that's true. Uh, and then when you do have to coordinate, that becomes a much more interesting problem. Um, the lack of a global clock. So normally, uh, on a single, single computer, single system, we can sort of say this event happened and then this event happened and then this event happened. When you don't have a global clock, you might even, you might have timestamps for all of them, but most computers drift by a few milliseconds at, at least. Um, sometimes the, there'll be several seconds off um, until you know something comes back and, and fixes the time zone. Uh, sometimes when that happens, events will go back in time as the computer's clock gets corrected. Sometimes they'll skip ahead. Um, you have to work around that either in um, sort of complicated coordination systems or by designing systems that that don't require this to be true. Um, I like the designing systems that don't require it to be true. It's not always an option, but it's generally easier later. Um, an independent failure of components. Uh, so, you know, maybe you want to send somebody an email when they register, but your email service is down at the moment. How do you confirm that? How do you make sure that that data doesn't get lost somewhere? How do you make sure that it gets delivered at all? Um, Okay, so they're hard. They're valuable, we think, they're hard. Uh, so how does Bitly in particular, and I, I think a lot of shops that I've talked to, how do we go about doing this? Um, first, uh, if you don't have to, don't. 
Um, this is a great problem to have. Uh, not everybody has it. Sometimes you just got to focus on shipping a product, maybe not worry so much about the distributed bit. Um, when you do have this problem, deal with it. Uh, so Bitly is a, a service-oriented architecture. Like I said, it is about 350 running services at any time. Some of those are databases, some of those are Nginx, some of those are uh, you know, web servers or Tornado or what they call Q readers. Um, Service-oriented architecture gives you a bunch of advantages. So, like I said, dozens of services, hundreds of services. Um, every individual service is smaller. It's more focused. It does sort of a single thing, um, hopefully well. You know, do one thing well, the Unix philosophy. Uh, compose, be compose easily. So uh, if you can wrap your head around just this one part, you've, you've got the entirety of that service. Um, because it does that one thing, it does it very well. Um, instead of trying to sort of be everything to everybody. Uh, that also sort of allows you to use the right tool for the right job. Um, Bitly uses a lot of Python and increasingly Go, uh, some Java. Uh, maybe in a data store you need Redis in one spot and MySQL or Postgres in another spot and React or, or Cassandra in another spot. Um, I do want to caveat, everybody always says this when talking about distributed services. Oh, it's great. You can you know, write it in whatever language makes sense. Don't, though. There's, there's a weight here. Um, against the operational overhead, right? If you're going to support another language or another framework, that's something that, you know, you have to be able to deploy, be able to run on your infrastructure, have all of your tools and be able to talk to all of your data stuff. And so there is the right tool for the right job is, is uh, you know, a potential benefit, but be careful about it. Um, and because everything is sort of smaller and focused, uh, you get to take advantage of low-cost commodity hardware. It's much cheaper to scale out on commodity stuff than it is to scale up on very expensive, you know, $50,000 a year co-located servers. Um, and Bitly uh, degrades. Bitly doesn't go down. It's incredibly difficult to actually get Bitly to go all the way offline. It's next to impossible to get a short link to not work. Um, metrics may be delayed. You know, those, those click counts that we saw at the beginning. Normally those take under five seconds. Sometimes they take a little longer. Um, but, you know, maybe email goes down for a little while, maybe different things happen, but Bitly does not ever fully go down. That would require multiple simultaneous meteor strikes. Um, a big lesson learned from, from Bitly and from you know the work doing this is that async is almost certainly better than synchronous, uh, unless it's not. Um, so it's important to understand sort of what your requirements are for each component. Um, things that you will probably run into are like the cap theorem and ACID for databases and is it eventually consistent? Is that okay? How durable is it? And those are things that you have to sort of understand and answer um, about a component when you start to say, can we talk to this asynchronously or do we need to do it synchronously? Um, async can provide better isolation between components. They leak less from one service to another. Um, it can provide much looser coupling. Uh, so if you're, we'll get to messages in a minute, but it can make those systems work almost with no knowledge of each other. Uh, it's much more flexible. Um, and it's much easier to deal with errors and load. Um, if something's async already and it takes a couple more seconds because you're spinning up more AWS boxes, right? It's not, it's not as big a deal. Um, the problem is that consistency is hard, uh, like, like this guy. Um, so there are certain things that you don't want to be async. When you shorten a link on Bitly, when you go up here and you type a thing and you hit shorten, that happens synchronously. That link is immediately available for you to use. Um, critical path things are going to be the things that are generally synchronous. Like if I shorten this and I put it on Twitter, it needs to work. Um, metrics incrementing is asynchronous. Like I said, it's usually within it's usually within a second, which is actually pretty impressive considering how many things it cascades through to happen. Um, it can be slightly more. It can lag a little bit. That's okay. It'll end up in the right bucket. Um, 
it's almost always under a minute. Like, and if it takes a minute for the thing to update, most people probably haven't noticed yet. So, another big one. Events are better than commands. And events are better than commands for a couple of different reasons. Um, think about it as like distributed observables. Um, so what is an event? Event is saying, this happened, not do this. Um, events, I like to describe them as sort of the river of data. Events flow one way. Commands have a response that you have to deal with. And while you're waiting for that response, you're waiting. Um, an event is just like, hey, this happened. If you care, here you go. This happened. Um, it's a constraint. It is a challenge sometimes to think of things this way, uh, that everything moves sort of one way through the system. But it improves the overall design and robustness and error handling. Um, it's kind of a worthwhile constraint. Again, better isolation. This is related to the um, the previous one about whatever the previous one was, sync versus async. Um, you know, you can sort of, again, ignore that other services exist at all. You only care about this event that happened. Uh, you don't really care who told you it happened, just that it happened. Um, so each system can sort of live in, in total ignorance. They can just all, you know, be happy little pigs. There's kind of a pig theme in these slides I'm picking up now. And then this becomes a little bit weird now with the pig theme. <laughs> Um, you can add and remove consumers without modifying the existing application, right? So if I all of a sudden uh, want to start recording that, hey, these, these events happened, and all I want to do is dump them to a file so that I can check later, um, that doesn't affect any of the existing systems. I don't have to start writing things to multiple places. Uh, and because of that, you can just change out implementations. You can take, this is, I believe, a jet engine that somebody has just popped out of the plane. That's cool. Um, so if you want to, if you have a service, you, you're doing something and you know that it's not going to change quite so much and you want to make it faster, you know, you can replace your Python or your Ruby or, you know, your sort of slow, easy prototyping language with Go or C. Um, and with these events and uh, rivers of data, annotations uh, are, are better than filters. So instead of filtering out data, um, annotate and republish to a downstream uh, stream. So annotate and republish downstream. So instead of saying like, all right, we're only gonna, we're only gonna geo-encode like a tenth uh, of clicks and then we're gonna pass those on. We geo-encode everything and then we republish that. And then if you care about where the geo data is from in a downstream system, you can then filter out downstream. Um, but if you just annotate and republish and annotate and republish, you get sort of a wider and wider uh, flow of data. but it becomes more powerful later on when you're like, you know what, we actually really do care about clicks from France. And hey, we've got all that data there. Dealing with failure, um, independent partial failure, right? Uh, so the general rule of thumb, as always, is play nice. Um, allow for uh, back pressure. This is. I mean, I guess that's a pressure gauge. Um, allow for back pressure, retries with back off, um, message queues like AMQP, NSQ, SQS, SNS, any of those tools that publish messages to consumers uh, can be really helpful here. They're a great way of absorbing some of that back pressure. Um, they're your pipes and your overflow valves. Um, instead of just hammering the service, you know, when you get that thing on Reddit that says Reddit's overloaded and you just keep reloading it and reloading it and reloading it, and you're like, I know this isn't helping. Um, so, you know, have some pressure release valves. Message queues are a great way to, great way to do that. Most of them have some retry mechanism. Um, route around failure whenever you can, much like the internet. Um, and spend a lot of time on, on monitoring. This is actually, uh, this is a Medium post that a friend of mine wrote uh, yesterday, I think, about user interface monitoring. And his great analogy was, you dump things, in his case, users, in our case, maybe events, um, into one end of a box. And that box has a Rube Goldberg machine in it. And then stuff comes out the other end, and you, you're wondering why only so much of it comes out. So you start drilling holes in the box. Uh, it's important to know where to put those holes and what things to look at and focus on actionable and um, meaningful metrics. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Generally, you can drill more holes until these things start leaking out the sides. but. Um, 
So Leslie Lamport, who I think is like the exact uh, image you, you expect of a computer hacker born in 1941, right? um, said a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't know existed can render your own computer completely unusable. Um, you want to avoid, avoid that. So you need to be able to find in this giant stack of distributed computers that may not even be physically real, um, where is the problem exactly? Uh, so monitoring is really a key, key part of that. You know, listen, understand, act, um, knowledge equals power. This is, I think, just showing off some of the Chaunceys. Um, all right, so wrapping things up. Distributed systems are awesome. They're, they're drool worthy. We have fun, but they're hard. Um, Bitly is hiring. Uh, I think Sean will want me to keep that slide in there. And uh, thanks. So. Service discovery. Um, Bitly uses well-named hosts mostly for service discovery. Um, so there are, I guess, there are sort of two answers to that question. Um, part of it is well-named hosts. Uh, at the groundwork where I work now, we, we use ELBs with host names and. We attach ASGs to those. Um, Bitly does a vaguely similar thing in a slightly more low-tech way because um, it predates those. Uh, the other half of it is Bitly relies very heavily on a tool called NSQ, um, which is a message bus. Uh, NSQ has a discovery mechanism sort of built alongside it that comes with it um, called uh, NSQ Lookup D. So when you Publish to say a local NSQ instance, so that you're you know not paying a lot of overhead for network. Um, that local NSQ instance publishes to the lookup box, says, "Hey, I have these messages for this topic." Um, workers ask that lookup box, "Where can I go find messages for this topic?" And then they connect directly. So, uh, a lot of the message infrastructure has discovery built in. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you.